It is uh, wonderful to see everyone out tonight. Uh, I know it's raining. Uh, I know the weather's terrible. Uh, but it is so good to be here uh, and to worship with you this morning, uh, tonight. Tonight. Uh, kind of a way of an announcement. Uh, the elders have decided that every fifth Sunday night uh, that we're going to hear from somebody else besides me and Mr. Terry. Uh, so if you are a man that's willing and ready to give a sermon, please come and talk to me. Uh, and I'll see if I can set you up with a fifth Sunday night of the month, fifth Sunday night of the month, and give you an opportunity to speak. Next weekend will be that fifth Sunday night, and uh, Jared Hargett is going to be speaking. Uh, so you all come out, support him, uh, hear him as he spends the gospel message to you. I said, and I told Jared that I was going to announce that, because now he knows he can't get out of it. And he will have to be here tomorrow, uh, next Sunday night to give that sermon. Not that Jared would ever get out of anything, but you understand that. If you go ahead and get out your Bibles and open to 2 Corinthians 7, uh, that's going to be our key text tonight, and we're going to go through that together. And you may want to put a marker in there or a piece of paper because we'll be constantly flipping back to that passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I put up here how to take a rebuking. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Kind of inspired from the phrase, how to take a beating. But this is going to be how to take something much better than a beating, a rebuking. Rebuking is a natural part of life. Correction, criticism is a natural part of our life here on this earth. And we were talking about this morning, if you were in the small auditorium class, how the world has this philosophy now that you should never correct anybody. That evil doesn't exist, you should always have a smile on your face, and you should never say, hey buddy, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. That would be cruel, that would be evil. But that's not the case. If we look just from a physical perspective, there's always correction and always rebuking to perfect something. When you're little and you go to kindergarten and you're learning how to spell, if you spell cat, K-A-T, and if you have a good teacher, she's going to correct you on the way you spelled that word, isn't she? She's going to rebuke you. No, Andrew, we use a C, not a K. And because she's a good teacher, she's going to correct you. And if you handle the rebuking the right way, you're going to make the correction, you're going to make the change, and you're going to grow from that. And you're going to be able to spell the right way. You're going to perfect your spelling. In sports, we have coaches to rebuke and to correct to perfect the game. To perfect the sport. This is why UAB was able to beat Iowa State. Number three. Because they had a coach, they had coaches that were willing to make corrections, to rebuke players, say, no, you need to do this, not this. And then we had players that were willing to say, okay, I understand. I need to make that change so I can perfect the game. And we could analyze anything, whether it be writing, whether it be sports, and show where there's a rebuking process to perfect. Now, the same can be sped for our spiritual life, your faith. How are you going to perfect your faith? How are you going to perfect your holiness? Well, you are going to have to be rebuked. You are going to have to be corrected. And we're going to look at that tonight. Usually when we talk about the rebuking process, uh, we only focus on the rebuker, not the one being rebuked. And I think that's because most Bible classes and sermons, and these need to be there, are all about Matthew 7. Uh, you have a plank in your eye and you try to go correct your brother with a speck in his eye. And God's saying, you're judging the wrong way. You have a plank in your eye. You need to first get that plank out of your eye before you can go to your brother and get the speck out of his. So we usually take it from, why do I need to rebuke my brother or my sister? And we look at it from that perspective. This is going to be the opposite of that. This is going to be how the person with the speck in their eye needs to handle the rebuking. And that's what we see in 2 Corinthians 7. What Paul is doing is he is boasting in the Corinthians for handling the rebuking that he gave them the right way. They handled it the right way. And that's what we'll be analyzing. To kind of give you a background into chapter 6. In chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, he's basically telling them, uh, and we have the famous line, do not be unequally yoked to non-believers. And what he was asking them to do is to stop Connecting yourself with these false teachers, they're going to pull you away without allowing me to rebuttal. 
You're connecting yourself to these men that are false teachers. They're just going to pull you away and you're completely ignoring me. Allow me to be in there and part of that to pull you back to the truth that is Christ. At the end of chapter 6, he quotes the promise. Uh, This is what I need to be in 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. It's funny when you're looking down and none of the verses are right. 2 Corinthians 6 at the end, Paul gives the promise. This is what the promise is that God has given to all of his people. Verse 16, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So we've been given this promise. You be my people, I'll be your God. You separate yourself from what's filthy, what's unholy. You become holy, you become my children, my sons and my daughters. And I will be your father. That's the promise. So if we want this promise from the Lord Almighty, well, then we have an application, and that's chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we talked about perfecting spelling. We talked about perfecting sports. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about perfecting holiness. Paul's mission in his life is he wants everyone to be a child of God. And if he sees someone leaving the fold of God, not acting like a child of God should act, he's going to say something. He's going to rebuke them. And this is what he did to the Corinthians. Before we go any more into this chapter, I want to make some very basic observations about rebuking. What we know beforehand, before we would read chapter 7. We want to perfect holiness. We know we're going to be rebuked. We're going to be corrected so we can be part of this perfecting process. We understand that none of us are already perfect. This is a very common misconception because our pride takes over and we believe we're perfect. None of us are perfect. We've been given very two powerful examples about how none of us are perfect. Peter and Paul were not perfect. Paul was not perfect. Philippians 3, 12. That's when he says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. That I may hold for which, which of Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Paul recognizes here, I'm not perfect. I have things I need to work on, but I press on because it's my goal. We know Peter was not perfect. Matthew 16, 23, this is where Jesus rebukes Peter. If you remember what happens there, Jesus prophesies his death, and Peter feels like he needs to rebuke Jesus. And he pulls him aside to try to tell Jesus, basically, uh, how to do his job, right? And he goes and he brings him, he says, Jesus, you don't need to be saying these things. And what does Jesus reply in Matthew 16, 23? It says, but he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Here, Peter, not perfect, being rebuked by Jesus. Both of these men were rebuked by Jesus. Paul on the road to Damascus was rebuked by Jesus. Peter, in Galatians 2, was rebuked by Paul. Everyone's rebuking everybody. Why is everybody rebuking everybody? Because we are all trying to attain perfection. We're trying to perfect our holiness. And the way we're going to do that is by correcting each other. If I see my brother wandering over here, I'm going to say, you need to get back. If you see me wandering over here, you need to say, get back. So we understand none of us are perfect. We all need to be rebuked. So logically, the next point would be, you will be rebuked. Everyone in this room has been rebuked before. If you have never been rebuked before, The reason why is because your brethren don't know you well enough to rebuke you. So then let me publicly rebuke you. You need to get to know your brethren better. Because that's how you're going to perfect your holiness, is you're going to have someone to watch your back and correct you. Just like Peter had Paul. Just like Peter and Paul both had Jesus. You need this process. I have been rebuked. And what's funny, I feel like, and maybe a lot of you can agree with me, is that I remember more clearly the times I've been rebuked than the times I've ever rebuked. Those times stay with me a lot more. 
I've been corrected a lot. Not even when I was young, but even today, I still am rebuked and corrected. Sometimes I feel like it's constantly. I get off this pulpit, I start walking down there. If you see Benny Williams walking up to me with his Bible up like this, you know what's about to happen. I'm rebuked, I'm corrected. And I'm sure Mr. Benny would say someone follows him around with a Bible, correcting Mr. Benny as we go. This is just what's to be expected. So if you're rebuked, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked at all. It's going to happen because none of us are perfect. So, so that these things, two things are true. Open your heart. Open your heart to those that will rebuke you in the fear of God. And that's what Paul's telling the Corinthians here. We just read 7 1. Now let's read 7 2. Verse 2 Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in our tribulation. We're going to explain more of what he's talking about, about being comforted by them. But Paul's saying, open your hearts to us. We're not here to hurt you. We're not here because we want to harm you. We're here because we want to help perfect your holiness. And that's why I've rebuked you. That's why we rebuke each other. So open your hearts to these people. Don't close yourself off. When you close yourself off from rebuking, you're not going to be perfected. You're not going to grow. You're not going to get any better because you closed yourself off from those that fear God. And that's a dangerous place to be. And that's a place that some of these Corinthians were in. They had tried to cut Paul off. And what happens when you cut someone like Paul off from your life? You're not going to be perfected. You're not going to grow. Because you cut off one of the one people that is willing to help you. So what he's going to say is he's going to perfect their holiness through the rebuking. But what they're going to develop is is godly sorrow because of the rebuking. And let me explain more of what's going on in chapter 7. He explains here in verse 5. For indeed when we have came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comfort us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter... I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For that you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Let me paint the story of what's going on with Paul. He says before he came to Macedonia, he was troubled. And he was in despair. We can go back to Acts 20 and we can see what was playing out in the story of Paul. Paul was in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, when he was there teaching, that's the last time that everything just blew up. Uh, All these people were trying to kill Paul. There was this angry mob. But Paul is able to escape and Paul goes to Macedonia. Now, beforehand, Paul writes them a letter. He says, I write a letter that I regretted at the time, but I don't regret it now. Now we understand that this letter was, must have been a letter of rebuke, of correction. That's what he regretted. But because of the way he handled it, he doesn't regret it anymore. Now most of us would read this and assume, oh, 1 Corinthians. That's what he's talking about. And probably so. A lot of people like try to debate on which letter he's talking about here. Not one of those people. It doesn't matter to me. It was a letter of rebuke. Probably 1 Corinthians. Telling them the things that they needed to correct in their lives to perfect their holiness. Now... He sends Titus to go check on the Corinthians after this letter. And Titus comes back to Paul from Corinth in Macedonia, meets up with them, and says, Paul, I have great news. They were mournful of the letter. They had zeal for Paul. And guess what? They've repented. They've made a lot of changes. They handled and they took the rebuking well. So what Paul's saying is, I'm comforted. 
I had all these problems in Ephesus. I'm having all these problems in Macedonia. I think mainly because Macedonia was in poverty. Not a spiritual problems, but financial problems with the Christians there. But he's saying, I've got some good news. I've got something to be joyful about. My brothers and sisters that were having all these problems have repented because of this rebuking. So this is what he's joyful about. Now he says that he's joyful because of their godly sorrow. Not that they're sorrowful. Not that they're sorry what happened, but because of this emotional reaction they had to the rebuking. And this is the emotional reaction we need to have when we are rebuked. If we look in verse 10, it explains more detail of what godly sorrow is. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow produces repentance repentance. He says, there's something y'all are doing wrong in your life. You need to get back on track. This is the evidence I have to back up why you're doing wrong in your life. They become sorrowful. They become upset. So what do they want to do? They want to make a change. So they repent. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And there in verse 10, where does repentance lead? Well, repentance leads to salvation. They were in their sin. Why does Jesus say, Come to me who are weary and heavy laden? Why does he say, Blessed is the poor in spirit? Because those of us that are God, have godly sorrow for the things that we're doing in our lives, those of us that are remorseful and actually care, man, I'm not where I need to be, we are the ones that seek after salvation. We are the ones that will seek after Jesus. So if you become godly sorrow, if you'll want to make a change, and you'll go after Christ, the one who can give you salvation. And then maybe you're in a situation, what we kind of talked about in Revelation last week, you can be somebody that has their name blotted out of the book of life. That you've just left God so far that he's had to take your name out of his book. Well, what can you do? You can become sorrowful about it if someone corrects you, or even if you correct yourself in that case, repent of your sins and come back to God again having salvation in Christ. This is why we have godly sorrow. He says in verse 10 as well that it's not to be regretted. This isn't something that you need to be so upset about after the fact because you handled it the right way. I'm going to make this point later on. But rebuking is not fun. No one enjoys being rebuked. No one truly really enjoys rebuking. As he says here, and if we read 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote that letter with tears. And he says there, at the time, I regretted it. I felt bad when I was having to tell you. When you have to rebuke a brother or a sister, it's nerve-wracking, it's hard, it's scary. It's not something we enjoy doing. You have to approach me and say, Andrew, uh, I think you lied about something. And I'm trying to make sure that, that this is okay, that this is straight, what's going on. That takes a lot of courage, and it's a scary thought. Now, if I get approached by that, and it's something that I did do, I would be upset. For one, I got caught. That in itself makes us upset. But hopefully we open up and we realize, I've sinned. That's what should really make me upset. It's not a fun process. But... If you handle it that right way, it can lead to repentance and it can lead to salvation. Therefore, it's not something to be regretted. You know what? I was in sin. That's upsetting that that happened. But guess what? My brother came and found me and he pulled me out of it. That's something not to regret at all. And this is why godly sorrow is not to be regretted. Let's look in verse 11, continuing on. Uh, I've been reading... Uh, Paul and, and me and Nolan and Hayden have been going over this book together. And something we keep on bringing out is that we feel like when Paul gets excited about something, he gets very poetic. And I think that's what you see here in verse 11. Because he's extremely joyful that they handled this the right way. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence is produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication in all things you have proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What zeal. What vindication. Wow, guys. And that's what he's saying. You received this. You became emotional about it. But then you turned that emotion into energy to diligently clear your name. Everybody stop what you're doing. We've been rebuked by Paul. We need to make a change. Let's go out and let's go make that change. 
And so what it is, is Paul's comforted by this. You have produced diligence to clear yourself. Oh, I've caused this sin. I've caused this wrong. I want to make sure that I've cleared myself. I want to make sure that I pay back everything that I need to do to make sure that we're okay. That I'm okay, number one, with God. That I'm reconciled to Him. That I'm also reconciled to anyone I may have harmed in my sin. That emotion will push you to do that. And he goes into this next thought. It comforts and encourages others. When you see someone who's godly, sorrowful for something they did, and do the right thing, repent, and come back to salvation. It encourages others. It encouraged Paul. Uh, Verse 13, Titus had come back, and he had been encouraged because of their outcome, because of what they did. Therefore we have been comforted in your comfort. And we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Let's also backtrack to verse 7. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation in which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. That Titus was encouraged because he saw a group of people repent. Repentance is not easy. It's not always easy. And to say that, oh, it's just something easy, something to do we do carelessly, something that's not important, is ridiculous to say. Because a lot of people in this world, a lot of people in this room, have changed and repented a long way. And it's something to be admired. And when you hear about this, or when you see people do this, when you see people handle or rebuking the right way, you see them come back to the Lord, it's something to be joyful about. The same situation of the prodigal son has returned. Go kill the fatted calf. My son was died and now is alive again. It's something that Paul rejoiced about. It's something Titus was rejoiced about. It's something we rejoice about. So there is this comfort that comes to all because of godly sorrow. Back in verse 10, Paul gives us the other reaction. And this is the way you do not handle the rebuking in a right way. Someone approaches you. Someone says, hey, Andrew, I think you've done something. There's a way I can handle that the wrong way. Is it there? And that is worldly sorrow. If we just read verse 10 again, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So, right off the bat, what does worldly sorrow do? Well, worldly sorrow produces death. And I believe he's talking about a spiritual death. Now we can go to Judas. Judas is a good example of this. He did something sinful. He betrayed Jesus Christ. And what happened because of his worldly sorrow? Well, he hung himself. Instead of repenting, instead of trying to reconcile himself with Christ when Christ came back to life, instead he decided to kill himself. In that situation, worldly sorrow produced death. But even more scary, even more important so, it produces spiritual death. If you handle it the wrong way, if you become so sorrowful in a worldly sense, it means you do not produce what's supposed to be produced. You don't reproduce repentance. You don't reproduce salvation because you've been worldly sorrowful. This is a sorrow that's not acting. It's a sorrow, I think, that's just being sad. Oh, someone has come up to me. Someone has said something to me. It hurt my feelings. But then never do anything about it. That's worldly sorrow. You're just sad. You're just upset that you got caught. That is not the way to handle a rebuking because nothing good is going to come out of it. Nothing at all. It produces death. But worldly sorrow is a prolonged sorrow. There's no end to worldly sorrow. Verse 8 For even if I made you sorry for my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a little while. The purpose of the rebuking, the purpose of the godly sorrow, it's only going to last a little while. You're going to be upset, it's going to hurt, it's going to sing a little bit, but you're going to repent, you're going to be led to salvation, you're not going to regret it anymore. Because you've been saved, because you've repented. Worldly sorrow doesn't do that, so what does it do? It doesn't last for a little while, does it? It goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and you never have an ending point to that sorrow. You're just upset that so-and-so said so-and-so to you. And that's a pitiful place to be for a Christian. And we know Christians that are still upset because eight years ago someone came and tried to correct them. Still. 
And maybe it'd be eight years, maybe it'd even be 50 years. That's a very silly way to act. Because there comes a time, if you're going to handle sorrow the correct way, is to get up, weaken, weaken. Strengthen your weakened knees, walk straight. There becomes a time to basically, and I'm trying to be nice when I say this, but to get over it. Let's turn to 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12. And I think this is a great Old Testament analogy of what we're talking about. David sinned, and David messed up bad, real bad. He killed Uriah, Bathsheba's wife, so he could have her. And Bathsheba became pregnant with a child, and David's in this huge mess. And David tries to make it all a secret. He tries to cover it up. But we have in 2 Samuel 12 is Nathan, really God speaking through Nathan, comes and rebukes David for what he's done. And he goes and he tells David about uh, this parable about a sheep. And he says, a rich man had a lot of sheep. A poor man had one sheep that he loved. And when a traveler comes in town, instead of the rich man killing one of his own sheep for the traveler, he goes and steals the poor man's sheep so he can give that to the traveler. Of course, David gets all mad. David said, tell me who did this. I'm going to go kill him. And Nathan says, David, that was you. You did that. And David, being a man after God's own heart, acts godly sorrowful. He acts exactly what he, he falls apart. He can't believe that he's done this. He becomes extremely upset. And then God just starts letting him have it. Uh, and you keep on reading there in the chapter 12. God said, I would have given you everything. I would have given you everything, but you threw it all away. God is extremely upset with David. And he says, the sword's never going to leave your house from here on out. And finally, David goes, I've sinned. I've done it. It was me. I was sorry. What do I need to do? And Nathan tells him uh, there in verse 13 that God has put away David's sin. So David has been atoned for the sins that he's committed. However, God is still going to take that child. That is David's fault that that child exists. That child really should have belonged to Uriah. God says, I'm going to take that child because of what you've done. Even though... He's still forgiven him up to this point. So you see David extremely sorrowful because of what he's done in the next couple of passages. Verse 15, Nathan leaves. And then it says, And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house rose up and went to him and raised up from the ground. But he would not. Nor did he eat food with them. There on the seventh, the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering... David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to the servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and when he was requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is it that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. And when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, and he shall not return to me. This child is dying, and David knows it's all his fault. So he's sorrowful. And he's on the ground, and he's praying, and he's fasting for seven days. And his servants try to come and get him and say, David, get up. Let's give you something to eat. David's saying, no. I want to be here. And David's just miserable at this point. But after the child dies, and David realizes it's over, David already does know that his sins have been atoned for. God has removed them. He decides it's time to get up. He decides, okay, the child's gone. There's nothing more. I can't change God's mind about that. What he does is he accepts it. He accepts what he's done. He accepts the fact that God has removed the sin, and he accepts the rebuking. It's time not to be sorrowful anymore. 
Because you have to press on. You have to survive. You have to grow. And if you're living and drowning in a sorrow because someone rebukes you, you're not growing. You're stuck. It's time to move on after you've repented, after you've gotten salvation. At some appointed time, it's time to move on. Don't be good drowning in worldly sorrow. What, what if the rest of this book was, and then David was still sorrowful about what he did with Bathsheba, and then for the next years of his life, he just sat there and, and cried and fasted because of his sin. If God forgives, if God's able to make you white as snow, if God is able to purge you with hyssop, if God is able to forgive you, you have to learn how to forgive yourself. Because God's opinion of you is the only opinion that matters. And if God has a good opinion of me, if God thinks I've forgiven Andrew of his sins, then I should be able to think, okay, you know what? I can forgive myself because God has forgiven me, because I handled the rebuking in the right way. Don't be so upset that you can't exist because of your sin. So this would be a prolonged sorrow if you were worldly sorrowful because of a sin you have committed. One more thing for worldly sorrow. It distracts you from your sin. And this is what I mean by this. Let me give you an example. You become so sad that someone's rebuked you that you're actually distracted from the sin. And it's no longer about the sin that's committed. It's all about the rebuking. I go back to Matthew 16. Jesus rebukes Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. That's what he says. Now, I can look and I can see that Peter must have handled this the right way because he continues to follow Jesus. But what if Peter did not handle this the right way? What if he was so upset that Jesus called him Satan? Goes over to his brother Andrew. Andrew, Jesus called me Satan. Go and go tell everybody. I'm, I guess what just happened? Jesus called me Satan. And goes on and on and tells everybody and eventually just stops following Jesus because Jesus rebuked him. Where would Peter end up? Well, he definitely wouldn't be apostle. And he probably wouldn't be a Christian because he would become so drowned by his sorrow. And by that point, it's not about that that, uh, Peter rebuked Jesus anymore. That's the sin. That's not what it's about anymore. It's about the rebuking that Jesus gave Peter. And we'll do that. Someone rebukes me instead of thinking, okay, this is about the sin. This is what needs to be the focus. This is what I need to repent of. I'm so consumed with the thoughts about the actual rebuking that I forget about it. To continue on this point, humans are clever. And when someone tries to correct us about anything, instead of just accepting the correction, we try to distract. We try to get away. And I just want to give you kind of some examples of that. There's no phrase to describe this, but we do see it happening. Uh, When the men in Corinth were being rebuked, they tried to attack Paul the way he looked to distract everybody from the things that were actually going on. So Paul says, you have divisions among you. You need to correct that. Well, they said, well, look at Paul. He's a bad speaker. Well, look at Paul. Look at all the scars on the body. Look how weak he is. They're trying to distract from the point, right? So to kind of give us on this idea, we call this a red herring, okay? And it's a literary term. And I call this whole thing red and rebuking because it's an easy way to remember it. I learned what a red herring was because of watch Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo, you'd always have a bad guy that you thought was the bad guy. You watched the whole show for 25 minutes. That guy's the bad guy. But in reality, that guy was just the red herring. He was supposed to distract you from the real bad guy. So he is the red herring. Here's a definition. It's something that misleads or distracts from a relevant or an important issue. It's supposed to distract you from the sin. It's the red herring. Also, we call it McCarthyism, the red scare. Some of you lived through this. But there was a time that Americans were so afraid of communism that they used this too as a red herring called the Red Scare. Joseph McCarthy was a senator of Wisconsin. And in the 50s, if anyone got on Joseph McCarthy's bad side, he would call you communist. You're communist. You'd be talking about something like environmental protection. Oh, well, you're communist. You try to attack McCarthy. You're calling everybody communist. Well, he'd call you communist. You see how ridiculous all that is. It's, again, a red herring. It's a red scare. It's McCarthyism. The practice of making unfair allegations in order to restrict criticism. I don't want you to criticize me, so I'm going to call you communist. And I've heard from older generations that this actually did affect faithful churches. That someone would be upset with an elder, so they would call them communist. 
That's how ridiculous this goes. So it's red and rebuking. They're red herrings. It's like a red scare. These are some things that we accuse our brethren of instead of just accepting the rebuking. So instead of just saying, I'm sorry, you're right, please help me get right back with God. Instead, I'm going to accuse you of things to distract you. So my sin is not the focus of what's going on. I can accuse you of unfair judgment. Andrew, I thought you lied. Andrew, did you lie? And I can say, well, why are you judging me? I can accuse someone of unfair judgment as a red herring, a red, to get you away from my sin. Because it's not about the sin anymore. It's about, are you judging me or not? And I think we've talked an awful lot about judgment. I don't want to have to read passages. You know you can judge people by their fruits. And of all of this, if you can't judge people by their fruits, there, there would be no rebuking process. There would be no way to perfect your holiness. So this would be a red scare in rebuking. This would be a red herring. Also, gossip. This may be chief of all of these. Someone comes and rebukes me. Andrew, I heard you lied. Maybe, Andrew, I heard you were drunk. Something like that. Well, instead of saying, you know, I was or I wasn't, I just accuse you of gossiping. Well, where'd you hear that from? You're all just talking about me behind my back. Y'all are just gossiping. We know gossiping is wrong. Paul says it's wrong. He says you've got busybodies that got nothing better to do than to talk about people. But the thing is, if someone comes up to you and asks if you did something, by definition, that's not gossip. You can't gossip about yourself, can you? That's ridiculous. And even on top of that, if people actually are gossiping about your sin, does that make your sin magically disappear? No. It doesn't matter. And I, frankly, I think you should kind of feel ashamed because now people are sinning because of your sin. So you can think about it from that perspective. If you're in this situation, before you accuse anyone of gossip, speak the truth, be honest about what really happened, correct yourself, And once the truth comes out, once you've repented, once you've come back to salvation, once you're demonstrating godly sorrow, people are going to be comforted. And the gossip is going to die. This can be used as a red in rebuking. What if you accuse your rebuker that they didn't do it in love? They didn't do it in love. Peter could have accused Jesus of not rebuking him in love, couldn't he? Jesus called me Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. And I understand that he probably wasn't actually calling him Satan. It was probably because he was tempting him not to die. And that's why he would kind of call him Satan. But regardless, Peter could have taken that way. Next thing you know, you got Peter saying that the Son of God, the Son of God didn't love him. If we look at it from that perspective, on that context, that would be very silly. But this is what we do to our brethren. Well, they just didn't love me. We know from Proverbs 27... Proverbs 27 5 says, Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Open rebuke is better than love concealed. What does that mean? That means if someone comes and is willing to openly rebuke you, they're actually showing you more love than when they keep it to themselves, keeping love to themselves. Because no one is going to have the courage or or the zeal or the willingness to correct someone unless they want you to have salvation. Look, I want you to have salvation. I want you to correct this. I want us to both share in Christ. I both want us to go to heaven together. That's why I'm correcting you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't say anything at all. I just want to condemn you to hell, wouldn't I? So that's a silly way to look at it. If someone actually does, does correct you and hate, that actually does happen. Does that magically erase your sin? No. It doesn't matter the way you were rebuked. You're still in sin if you actually had sinned. One more of these different red scares or or red herrings. The one who rebuked has a plank in his eye. Someone comes and rebukes me and they have a plank in their eye. Now I could just accuse them of this to cause a red herring and to distract the, my, uh, distract the sin in my life to try to push it on them. Or it could actually be true that someone with a plank in their eye chose to tries to correct your speck. Let's actually read this in Matthew 7. We keep on talking about it, but we should actually just go ahead and read it. Matthew 7, verse 1. Jesus, of course, speaking here, Judge not that you be judged, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. For with whatever measure you use, it will be measured back to you. 
And why do you look at your speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So, if someone approaches you, says that you've sinned, tries to rebuke you, and they have a plank sticking out of their eye, and you actually do have a speck in your eye, and they say you have a speck in your eye, just because that person has a plank in their eye, does that make your speck magically go away? It's still there. And it still needs to get out. And I know Jesus is actually talking to the one with the plank in his eye. But what we've all talked about, I can say, if you have a speck in your eye, quickly get the speck out of your eye, accept the rebuking, fix the problem, repent, and then go help your brother get the plank out of his eye. So you can do it backwards there. And it's absolutely fine. And what it becomes here in this situation is a pride problem. And all of this stuff really goes back to pride. How dare the brother with the plank in his eye try to correct Me. That's the attitude we have. How dare this person, this person that's had all these problems in his life, dare to correct me? That is a terrible attitude to have when we talk about sin. Terrible. I feel like sometimes I've actually had it in my life. And I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's my story and something personally that happened to me. But there was a time when someone I felt that had a plank in their eye came and corrected me. Very new convert, didn't really know much about the Bible at all. And he came up to me and he said, Andrew, you said this. Surprise, surprise, Andrew's mouth gets him in, pro- in trouble. It's true. Andrew, you said this, and I didn't think you should have said that. And he was extremely nervous. He, he, you could see that he just didn't really want to do, but he felt like he needed to. Well, the first thing I think of is how dare this person come and correct me. And again, that's a terrible attitude to have. This person was learning his ABCs when I was learning the books of the Bible. I can quote all the judges. I can quote all the apostles. I did that when I was three. This guy can't even do it now, and he's 22. That's the attitude we have, and that's a terrible attitude to have. What it is 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 you have someone that has enough courage and enough love and enough care and enough comfort that they're actually concerned about someone. That's the real situation. And even if it was, there was a speck in my eye, and, hey, I got it out, then I needed to go help and encourage that brother. Now, going along with Matthew 7, 1, if there is a speck in my eye, I may not want the person with the plank helping me get it out. That's what it should be for obvious reasons. But you know what I can do? I can't go to a third party, can I? Someone that doesn't have anything in their eye. They can help me get the speck out, and we can both go help the person get their plank out. Because this isn't about hurting people, even though sometimes it doesn't hurt. This isn't about pride. This isn't about being selfish. This is about perfecting our holiness. This is about growing closer to Christ. Let's close with this proverb. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself. And he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase his learning. Someone comes and rebukes you and you love them in return, that means you're a wise man. If you come and comes and rebukes you and you make the correction, you repent, you have the God, all all the stuff we've been talking about, that means that you're going to increase in learning. That means you're going to become stronger and you're going to perfect your holiness. One reason, uh, and people sometimes get annoyed. Uh, that we are constantly correcting people, we are constantly rebuking people, we are constantly calling out evil, is because we want people to come to Christ. Uh, that, that's the whole reason. Uh, the reason why we give the invitation after every sermon, the reason why we always talk about it, the reason why Mr. Terry explained, have you been called yet all this morning, it is because we are trying to get people to come to Christ. And I think that's because those of us that have tasted salvation understand that it is so sweet that everyone should try it. Everyone should share in it. Anyone who is willing to accept the salvation in Christ. If you'd like to be baptized tonight, we will do that. If you want to study, and you want to study tonight, we will do that with you if it means you coming to salvation. If you'd like to, please come.